Okay, joining us today is Secretary, our new Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, who was confirmed just last week. We wasted no time. As you all know, Secretary Fudge served as U.S. Representative for the 11th Congressional District of Ohio for more than 12 years. She's a former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and earned a reputation of tackling the unique challenges of her district by working across political ideologies. In 1999, Secretary Fudge was elected the first female and first African-American mayor of Warrensville Heights, Ohio, a position she held for two terms. As mayor of Warrensville Heights, she adopted one of the first vacant and abandoned property ordinances in the state. Additionally, she brought new residential development to the city and addressed the city's growing foreclosure crisis through the formation of a long partnership that helped residents maintain the financial security needed to buy or keep a home. Uh, as Secretary Fudge has said, her first priority as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development is to alleviate the housing crisis and get people the support they need to come back from the edge. She's happy to take a couple of questions uh, after she gives some remarks. Thank you again for joining Thank you. us. Thank you very much, Jen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if I was in this room by myself. Uh, Jen, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to speak about the importance of the American Rescue Plan as it relates to the urgent needs, uh, housing needs facing our nation today. Uh, what a way to complete my very first week as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. At HUD, we know firsthand the severe impact of COVID-19 on our nation's housing crisis. HUD staff in every region of the country have worked tirelessly to assist grantees and recipients of HUD assistance in their response to the pandemic. We've helped, nurse, home, we've helped housing owners, housing authorities, and communities provide additional rental assistance and support new efforts to eradicate homelessness. We've extended the Federal Housing Administration's foreclosure and eviction moratoriums until June 30th to support the immediate and ongoing needs of homeowners. Under the Biden-Harris administration, HUD is making greater efforts to keep Americans safe from COVID-19. We're strengthening partnerships between recipients of HUD assistance and public health agencies and health care providers. Many of the people living in, living in federally assisted housing have risk factors that make them particularly vulnerable to COVID. These factors include disability, race and low income, along with racial and ethnic disparities in access to response care and treatment. We're making sure that federal, state and local efforts to reach those most at risk of COVID are linking those efforts to people living in housing HUD supports. The American Rescue Plan is critical to our success in these efforts. Some of you may know that my last vote as a member of Congress was for the American Rescue Plan. I was proud to vote for this historic legislation to get help to the American people during this moment of great challenge. I thank President Biden for the leadership that has gotten us to this point. The American people can be confident that help is here. The President has described the American Rescue Plan as shots in arms and money in pockets. I would add, it relates to housing. The American Rescue Plan keeps people housed and brings people home. And with that, I would take any questions that you would, that Jen is gonna allow me to take. So y'all make- oh, Any time. Jen, is, on, Jen is in charge, I'm just here. <laughs> Go ahead. If I can, Secretary Fudge, thank you for being here. We appreciate your time today. The, the you. head of the National Housing Conference said that HUD's ranks have been gutted, morale has never been lower, and the challenges to HUD's constituents have never been higher. Just in simple terms, can you describe the state of your department as you take it over today? Well, I would say this to you, uh, and I actually had the opportunity to talk to the President about it since I've been here. We are thousands of people short of where we ought to be. Uh, our staff is outstanding. They are under-resourced, understaffed, and overworked. But we are going to make some major changes and very quickly. The rescue plan is allowing us to do things that we may not have been able to do without it. So I am especially pleased that the President had the foresight and the vision to give us a historic, maybe one-time opportunity to change what is going on in housing in this country. You put out some new numbers today as they relate to homelessness yes. in this country right now. Obviously, it's a number that the, the whole country is dissatisfied by. Thinks the number should be much lower. 
Um, I'll ask this in two different ways. One, can you set a goal where you think that number should be and in what time frame you think you can meet such a goal to reduce homelessness in, country, in this country? And specifically, for some of the blue parts of the country that some Republicans have criticized, San Francisco, New York, where the homeless numbers have been high, what specific advice and what you can speci specifically do to target those communities to alleviate those, uh, those high numbers? Well, the first thing I say is that the president gave us a charge early on as to what he wanted us to focus on, especially in the first 100 days. Homelessness was at the top of the list. One was expanding vouchers. Uh, thirdly, he wanted us to find ways to expand and put in the market new affordable housing. So with the $40 billion that has come that we have now, what we expect is this. We have $5 billion set aside to do nothing but address homeless issues. So we know that with those resources, over the next probably 12 to 18 months, we know for a fact that we can get as many as 130,000 people off the streets. Um, we also know that our local partners are going to assist us in finding other rental uh, opportunities. So we believe we can put a major dent in it. But if nothing else, what we will let them know is that there is an opportunity to find a way off the streets. Uh, we, are, we, we have more programs in place to assist people who are already in public housing to find a way to buy housing. We know that affordable housing is a problem all across this country. I don't know where my Republican colleagues live that don't think that, it, that there is a problem, but there is. So many of us just choose to ignore it. Thank you, Ms. Adams, I hear for being here. Uh, the, the federal moratorium on evictions is set to expire at the end of this month. Are there plans to extend that? And if not, what do you say to families who are worried that they may be facing eviction? Well, what I would say first is that the HUD moratorium expires on June 30th. Uh, the CDC is in the process of trying to determine what is the appropriate way forward, and I would hope that you would ask them that question. And just one more, if I can. Um, the uh, experts tell us that, that the December tranche of COVID relief is just now starting to come online. People that we've talked to are still seeing some big glitches, you know, when, when they try to apply. Are you confident that states and localities now have the systems in place to get this, as well as the next round of funding? Well, I'm very confident. I've talked with uh, Secretary Yellen. The Treasury Department is, is up to the task. I mean, certainly it is a different Treasury Department, so I'm very confident that if they say that they can get it out in a certain period of time, they will. Our job in, at HUD is just to give the kind of guidance and assistance once those funds are received. Hey, Secretary. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, you mentioned earlier that, um, that, that housing prices are, are, are increasing. Also, the supply of new inventory on the market is decreasing at the same time. What is, can the administration do to either get more homes on the market or bring prices down? How concerned are you about, about that dynamic? There are a couple of things that we know can happen out of this rescue package. One is if you look at places like a, a Los Angeles where they have actually purchased hotels and motels, et cetera, to give people an immediate place to go, there's re there are resources in the plan to do that. The other thing that we find is that part of the problem with the market is that credit is not available and accessible to people who actually do qualify. So since FHA is certainly a part of what, what, what we do, uh, we're going to ensure that we can talk about down payment assistance. We're going to talk about maybe some restructuring. We are going to make sure that people who qualify have access to credit. We all know that there have been problems uh, across this country for many, many years. That is why I'm so pleased that President Biden talks about equity. He talks about equality, closing the, the, the racial wealth gap, which is bigger today than it was 50 years ago. So we, we know that we have the tools. Uh, I think it was just a matter of making sure that we have the will to use them. We have the, we now have the will. Madam Secretary, thank you again. Um, you. Back to the homelessness report that you guys put out this morning. The way that test is done, as you know, is you test over a few days in January of the previous year. Correct. So that was pre-pandemic 2020. 580,000 people on the streets pre, I mean homeless, pre-pandemic, correct. 2.2% increase from the year before. Do you have any sense of how much more homelessness may have increased once that pandemic began, say, April, May into the summer? I can't give you numbers. We know that it has in increased. We just don't know those numbers. So really not till next January will we Correct. be able to get some sense of how it might have affected. Correct. And Nancy? 
Nancy and Alex, and then we'll have to let the secretary go back to work. Go ahead, Nancy. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Two questions. Um, one, does the Biden administration have any plans to restore or tweak that Obama-era fair housing regulation, which the Trump administration weakened in the summer of 2020? We are looking at it. Uh, certainly, we know that fair housing is, in fact, the law of the land, and we want to use every tool we have. I think that the uh, prior administration did roll back some fair housing uh, tools that we have. So we're looking at how we can go back and make those better and get them re-implemented, if possible. And then just second question, what are your thoughts on whether or not there's a housing bubble right now in the U.S.? Well, I, I, I would say that that's a kind of a tricky question. Um, there are those who would say yes. I would say at this point that until I can get the kind of data that I need from the GSEs and from FHA, that's not, a, that's not something that I could really give you an accurate answer on. Uh, but I know that there is a problem with the market today. Alex, make it a good one, Alex. No pressure. <laughs> well, I, I, got, I got two because I'm going to be just a little bit greedy. One from our housing reporter, which is, are there some parts of the COVID response, whether or not in ARP or generally, that are currently temporary that you would like to see permanent when the crisis eases? Oh, I'd like to see most of it permanent, no question about it. Um, I think that when we talk about housing needs, we can't at this point come up with enough money to, to take care of all the homeless people in this country. We cannot, through this package alone, repair and restore 50-year-old housing uh, authorities across this country, which are crumbling every day. We cannot abate lead in every single building we need to with these resources. We need at least another 70 to $100 billion to do those things. So yes, I'd like to see a stream of resources available to do this, not just in this package, but ongoing. And the second question is, you may have seen that former Congressman Richmond weighed in on uh, the primary to uh, succeed him in his congressional seat. Who? who? Congressman Richmond. I've yeah. <laughs> never heard of him. Oh. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to take the opportunity to weigh in on your race and you know who you think can, uh, should succeed you and what you're looking for. No. <laughs> All right. So how about the Senate race in your state? Are there Democrats that should run? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, well, I have two friends that are thinking about it. Tim Ryan, of course, is thinking about it. I understand Nan Welly is thinking about it. I mean, I think we're going to put a good person in that race, no matter who we choose. But they're both friends. I think we have a good shot at it. I know people have written off Ohio. I haven't written off Ohio. I believe we can win the Senate race. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Clark. Looking forward to having you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. OK. Have a, what'd you say? We, can have walk -off <laughs> we, we can. Wait, wait till month three. Wait till month three. We'll be rolling it out with people's second visits. Uh, as we announced yesterday, I just wanted to give you a little bit more information on the schedule for next week. We, you may have seen we confirmed uh, that the president will be traveling to Columbus, Ohio on Tuesday, uh, the anniversary of the Affordable Care Act being signed into law. The trip will be a part of our Help Is Here tour and will highlight how the American Rescue Plan will lower health care costs for many American families. And this is a component of the package that we've talked about, but we're still working to ensure the American people understand how they can benefit from this particular piece. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has been an important lifeline for Ohio families for 11 years. The law cut the state's uninsured rate by half, dropping from 12 percent to 6 percent. It has also provided critical consumer protections for millions more by preventing insurance companies from discriminating based on pre-existing conditions. Uh, and the American Rescue Plan makes coverage under the ACA even more affordable for Ohio families. Over 90,000 currently uninsured Ohioans can get a better deal on health insurance because of the law and premiums for people who have coverage under the ACA. And the former Ohio governor was one of the first, if not the first, Republican governor uh, in the country to expand Medicaid access uh, during that period of time. And that is some, certainly something we continue to note around here. Um, another update on the schedule is uh, uh, in the wake, uh, well, a couple of updates, I should say, part on the schedule and part on the steps we're taking as it relates to the horrific events in Atlanta earlier this week. 
In the wake of the horrific shootings in Atlanta on Tuesday, the President ordered the U.S. flag to be flown at half-staff as a mark of respect for the victims of these senseless acts of violence. The President and the Vice President will also meet with representatives from the Georgia Asian American and Pacific Islander community when they travel to Georgia on Friday. They will meet with the state legislators and community ad advocates to hear about the impact of the incident on the community and to get their perspective on the rise in anti-Asian uh, hate incidents. The President will off also offer his support for the AA AAPI community in Georgia and across the country and talk about his commitment to combating xenophobia, intolerance and hate. As many of you may know, and I think we were, I've been asked about this in here previously, but Senator Maisie Hirono and Congresswoman Grace Meng have introduced legislation that calls for expanded DOJ review of COVID-19 related hate crimes, for guidance from DOJ to law enforcement for best practices in reporting hate crimes, and ensures that hate crimes information and reporting is more accessible to Asian American communities. The President applauds this, their leadership on this issue, including along with Chair Judy Chu's, and he strongly supports these crucial aims of this legislation. He issued a presidential memorandum his first week in office directing the Attorney General to support state and local agencies and AAPI communities to prevent hate crimes and expand data collection and public reporting. That is ongoing. The outreach and engagement from DOJ is already underway. Uh, there's also a role for HHS to play, which we expect can uh, pick up more once Secretary Becerra, future Secretary Becerra, is, is, uh, is sworn in. Uh, and as I noted yesterday, uh, also from here he's asked Cedric Richmond, uh, who of course we've all heard of, and a former congressman, and uh, Susan Rice to uh, lead an effort to engage with the community as well. Um, <clears throat> Last piece, uh, today the House will also be voting on the American Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. President Biden and this administration support passage of both pieces of legislation. These bills would provide a path to citizenship for dreamers, individuals with temporary protected status, and farm workers. Both pieces of legislation passed the House last Congress with bipartisan support and have broad support from the American public. These bills, in his view and our view, are critical milestones toward much needed relief for the millions of individuals who call the United States home, and an acknowledgement that a path to citizenship for these essential workers is critically important to our economy and our nation's food and agricultural sectors. We also urge Congress to reform other aspects of our immigration system by passing President Biden's bill, the U.S. Citizenship Act, a, a, a package, a bill that he uh, proposed on his first day in office which would establish a new system to responsibly manage and secure a border, bring long overdue visa reforms to keep families together and grow our economy and address the root causes of migration from Central America. With that, Zeke, kick us off. Thank you, Jen. Um, just following up on a little scooplet from our colleague Jeff over here. Um, a scooplet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Reuters calls it scooplets. Uh, but. If you can uh, uh, confirm that the U.S. plans to loan uh, 4 million AstraZeneca vaccines to Mexico and, and Canada. What's the timeline for when that, mm -hmm. that transaction would take place? And why only 4 million of the stockpile that is several times that when for vaccine is an offer here? Absolutely. So as I've noted in here before, but worth noting again, uh, our first priority remains vaccinating the U.S. population. Uh, the reality is that, but the reality is the border knows no, uh, the, the, uh, pandemic knows no borders, uh, and ensuring our neighbors can contain the virus is a mission critical uh, step, is mission critical to ending the pandemic. We have three vaccines approved, as you well know, uh, and uh, of course uh, there's a rigorous review process by the FDA. Uh, there are other vaccines, of course, including AstraZeneca, that are going through the approval process now, and we have been taking action here to get ready to get those vaccines to the American people if they are approved. As we await, FDA approval here in the U.S. Many countries, as you know, have already requested, uh, have requested the, uh, have already approved AstraZeneca and also have requested our uh, doses from the United States. That includes Canada and Mexico, but is certainly not limited to Canada and Mexico. Uh, and balancing the need to let the approval process play out of the AstraZeneca vaccine 
uh, as it's taking place in the U.S. with the importance of helping stop the spread of the of in other countries. We are assessing how we can loan doses. It's not. It's it's we are we are that is our aim. It's not fully finalized yet, but that is our aim and what we're working toward uh, to Canada and Mexico. This is a complex process, and our team is working with the companies uh, to move it forward. Um, and I want to on your question about the number of doses. There have been a range of reports about the number of doses. I can confirm that uh, we have seven million releasable doses available uh, of AstraZeneca, and as noted in Jeff's scooplet, which I'm just going to keep calling it, uh, 2.5 million of those. We are working to uh, finalize plans to lend those to Mexico and 1.5 million to Canada. And what's the nature of, with, of, of that transaction? Would, uh, would it just be for future AstraZeneca production? Or would there be a Meaning what's, what's in the loan? Yeah. Uh, it could be for future AstraZeneca doses or other doses, yes. And uh, uh, on a different topic, I was wondering if you see, saw the comments from uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin this morning uh, uh, responding to the president's uh, uh, comments in the interview on Tuesday night. Is the president worried at all that he may have inadvertently started a little war of, uh, war of words and uh, uh, trading shots back and forth that can get in the way of uh, having finding some common ground on various shared priorities? Well, President, Put uh, president Biden and President Putin uh, certainly have different perspectives on their respective countries and uh, how to approach engagement in the world. Uh, but where they agree is that we should continue to work for way look for ways to work together, as was noted in part of President Putin's comments. And uh, there are areas of mutual interest. New START, which we just extended for five years, is an example of that. Obviously, Russia is also a uh, member of the P5 plus one as we look ahead to what's possible there as it relates to uh, you know, preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. So uh, we are confident that we can continue to look for ways where there's a, a mutual interest, mutual national interest, uh, but uh, the president is not going to hold back, clearly, uh, when he has uh, concerns, uh, when he has, um, uh, whether that it is with words or actions. Uh, go ahead. I'll go to you next. You have a, a scooplet. You can go after a few other people. Go ahead. <laughs> on, on, on that same topic, you know, obviously you, you, you say that you want to work together with Russia on areas mm -hmm. of mutual agreement, but Russia has now decided to recall its ambassador. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a concern that the president agreeing that Russian President Putin is a killer could escalate tension even further? Well, our ambassador, Sullivan, remains in Moscow. Uh, we remain uh, engaged, and he remains engaged, as does our team on the ground with the Russian people. We continue to believe that diplomacy is the first step and should always be the first step uh, and should be our objective uh, as we pursue all relationships, even with our adversaries. Uh, so, um, you know, we are hopeful that that will continue to be the case. I just want to get your reaction to actually some of Putin's exact words here, because he responded with a bit of a euphemism that translates roughly to, it takes one to know one, pointing to slavery in America, treatment of Native Americans, the atomic bombing of Japan. Does the president have any response to that kind of language? Well, the president believes that one of the greatest attributes of the United States is our honest self-reflection and our constant striving for progress. And there's always more work to do, as he's stated himself. Uh, so uh, I can't, I've been doing this long enough not to try to get in the mind of President Putin, uh, but um, I can assure you that uh, President Biden uh, still believes there's more work we can do here in our own country. Go ahead. Just to follow up quickly, does, you're talking about self-reflection. Does mm -hmm. President Biden regret calling Vladimir Putin a killer? No, the president gave a direct answer to a direct question. So then how is that, how, you don't want to escalate tensions, how is that constructive to the relationship when you talk about diplomacy being primary between the U.S. and Russia? How is calling Vladimir Putin a killer constructive to that relationship? Well, President Biden has known President Putin for a long time. They've both been on the global stage for a long time, worked through many iterations of a relationship between the United States and Russia, uh, and he believes we can continue to do that. Does the president believe that the leaders of Mohammed bin Salman, the head, one of the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, does he view him as a killer? I don't think I need to add more killer names from the podium just today. But. 
Uh, oh. I, I won't ask you about other countries that as well. Okay. Um, but let me, let me ask you about immigration. <laughs> yeah. If I, can, if I can quickly. The president sure, has ahead. made it very clear in his, in his recent interview that the border is not open, mm -hmm. effectively that it's closed, except for these unaccompanied minors right mm -hmm. now under humanitarian grounds yeah. for being welcomed into the U.S. But as we speak, crews from multiple outlets, including those from NBC News, are at the border mm -hmm. they're seeing many migrant families being accepted, young families being accepted into the country right now. So can you square those two when the message was that families and uh, individuals were being sent home but unaccompanied minors were being kept, why young families are in fact being kept here in the U.S. Um, and detained? Well, we've talked about this a little bit in here before, but and we are still applying Section 42, uh, which uh, and with the ex exception is, of course, unaccompanied minors. Uh, we are uh, there are uh, limited scenarios, limited circumstances where we are very limited, I should say, where uh, families are um, uh, coming across, going through uh, proper protocols at the border. Uh, being tested uh, and and then having their cases adjudicated. Part of this is that uh, part of the reasoning is that uh, of course we've closed Matamoros and some uh, there there has been some uh, less participation in keeping some of these families in Mexico than in the past. Uh, in in many of these policies we have supported, but the vast majority of people, vast vast majority who come to the border are turned away. The border is not open. These are very limited scenarios. <coughs> Sorry, I just swallowed some mask here. It's but okay. How, we've, how we've all been there. How limited is very limited. How many are being allowed in as mm -hmm. it relates to families? And specifically, if the message that the president was sending this week is that the border is not open, what is the message to those families, given some are being allowed in right now? The message continues to be. I'd be happy to provide you the numbers. I think CBP has the most up-to-date numbers, so I'd point you to them, and they provide those regularly. We'd certainly support that. I don't have them in front of me right now. I would say the message continues to be, now is not the time to come. The vast majority of families, of individuals, are sent back, are, are not welcomed across the border. And that's a message we will continue to convey clearly. And just to follow up, you talked about how the president saw those photos in one of the recent briefings as it relates to these shelters, mm -hmm. detention centers, decompression centers. I'm not sure what specific photos he saw. Um, we asked yesterday, we'll ask again today, can you provide those? Will you provide those to uh, the American public to see what it looks like there right now? Well, first let me say that the White House and we all in the administration support finding a way to grant access to the media, to the HHS and OR facilities or the shelters where uh, these children are uh, are staying for a temporary period of time before they are placed with family members or with sponsored homes. Uh, the Office of Refugee Right Resettlement is has not been hosting, as you've noted, media tours of unaccompanied children facilities currently due to the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, but we remain committed to transparency and we're considering potential options and we hope to have an update on that soon. So even if we didn't get a tour, can you provide us the photos that the president was provided? Uh, they, there was a private briefing, uh, an internal briefing from several weeks ago. Uh, we typically don't provide those materials publicly, but we do want you to be able to, uh, or a pool of media, uh, to be able to have your own uh, visuals and get your own footage of these facilities. Thanks, Go ahead. A few things. Um, back to Russia for a second. Yeah. There, there was the solar winds hack. There was the reported bounties on the heads of U.S. Yes. troops, the president said in this interview, something on that is coming. What is the holdup? When is when is the response from the United States coming? Because he inferred in the interview, you know, stay tuned. Right. Well, we also have already uh, put forward sanctions on in, in response to the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Uh, there's already been a release of a, of a report about uh, their engagement in the 2020 election. And we will have responses to each of these uh, malign actions uh, that we have expressed concern about and the president has offered a review of. Weeks, not months, remains still the policy. Uh, there's, of course, internal policy decision making about uh, uh, to to assess and take a look at the review, but also to make decisions about policy engagements. Some of the responses may be seen, some may be unseen, and of course, the president reserves the right to respond in a manner and time of his choosing, as any president would. But he did make clear uh, that there that the Russian government will pay a price. On these uh, vaccines going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. This comes, of course, as the United States is talking to Mexico about this border situation. Mm -hmm. Were there any strings attached regarding the situation on the border with this decision to give AstraZeneca doses to Mexico? Well, there are several diplomatic 
conversations, parallel conversations, many layers of conversations with any every country, Mexico, Canada, Europe, Asia, around the world, and certainly uh, being part of contributing to uh, preventing the spread of a global pandemic is part of one of our diplomatic objectives. Another one of our diplomatic objectives is working to address the challenges uh, at the border. Uh, so it shouldn't be a surprise that those conversations are both ongoing and happening. If I'm hearing you, the vaccine was given, were there expectations set with the Mexicans that they helped deal with the situation on the border? The, we, there, have been, there, have, there have been expectations set outside of, uh, unrelated to uh, any vaccine doses or requests for them, that they would be partners in dealing with the crisis on the border. Uh, and there have been uh, requests unrelated that uh, uh, they, for doses of these vaccines, um, every relationship has multiple layers of conversations that are happening at the same time. We shouldn't rule out, or the United States isn't ruling out, using our vaccine stockpile in terms I'm, of... I'm, I'm, actually try, I'm actually trying to convey that with every country, there's, there's rarely just one issue you're discussing with any country at one time, right? Certainly that's not the case with Mexico. It's not the case with any country around the world. Um, and so uh, I wouldn't read into it more than our uh, uh, ability to provide, to lend vaccine doses of a vaccine that we have some available supply on to a neighboring country where there is a lot of traffic that goes back and forth between the countries. Two other quick ones, one related to the Atlanta shooting. Uh, you've been asked this before, but in February of last year, then candidate Biden said that on his first day of office, he'd send a bill to Congress repealing the liability protection for gun manufacturers and closing the background check loophole. I know you've been asked about mm -hmm. this. There's an attorney general in place now. When, if any, when might we hear more about the administration's plans regarding gun violence? It remains a commitment, a personal commitment of the president to do more uh, on gun safety to put more measures in place, to use the power of the presidency to work with Congress. And certainly there is an important role, as you noted, for the Attorney General and the Justice Department to play uh, on in this regard. Uh, I unfortunately don't have any updates for you today, but it is an issue he remains committed to. And one quick local issue, the House Oversight Committee on Monday is holding a hearing on D.C. statehood. Mm -hmm. The President is a supporter of this. Yes. Does he think it could, if it passes the House, does it have a chance in the Senate, given the filibuster situation right now? And what would he or the White House say to the critics who suggest that this is designed to be a Democratic Party power grab just to get a few more seats in the House and the Senate? I think he would say that um, the half a million people who live in D.C., am I getting that number right? A little more than that. A little more than, it's grown since I left and went to the suburbs. Uh, would, would argue with that point, and so would he. I mean, he believes they deserve representation. That's why he uh, supports D.C. statehood. Go ahead. Um, has the administration uh, made any effort, this is just a Putin-related sure. question, has the administration made any effort to find out what was said during the previous president's two-hour long one-on-one -on -one meeting with Putin in Helsinki? <clears throat> It's a great question. Obviously, there's intelligence reports that may reflect that, but I'm not aware of any specific deep dive into that. I'm happy to check if there's more on it. And just, I'm sorry, one more question. Um, the Chinese government has indicated that it wanted, to, it wants to meet with President Biden virtually in April before mm -hmm. that climate summit. I'm wondering if the Biden administration is open to that, um, and if there have been any talks about setting that meeting. Up. I know we'll have more on the climate summit, which is just over a month away now, so it's coming closer. And there are, of course, a range of international p global participants uh, that we anticipate being a part of it. But we're not at the stage where we're discussing bilateral meetings at this point in time. Go ahead, David. Oh, sorry, Jeff. I can't really, I'll come back to you next. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. Go ahead, David. <laughs> maybe Mr. Scoople should go first. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Uh, sorry to uh, go back to the Russia sure. question here, but um, the president now, by my count, has said that Russia would pay a price for solar winds. Mm -hmm. He has said that they would pay a price for Navalny, and as yep. you pointed out, there have already been some sanctions there. Yeah. Yesterday, he seemed to suggest that uh, they would pay a price uh, in addition for the meddling in the 2020 uh, elections. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, your own colleagues seem to have sanctions fatigue out here. You've been Who are my you colleagues? Were, you in were, the government? Or in your, your colleagues in the, in the State Department, the West Wing, I mean, oh. you announced sanctions on Russia back when you were State Department uh, spokeswoman. Uh, is there any evidence that the method that we're using so far of sanctions 
is actually affecting Putin's behavior? I don't think we would rely, David, on sanctions alone. Uh, we do think that they have been effective uh, modes. I mean, history, you've written many stories about it, about the role sanctions have played in moving global diplomacy forward, and we certainly are a believer in that. But uh, as you also know, there are a range of tools at any pre uh, the disposal of any president, uh, seen and unseen, and I'm just not going to get ahead of the process of what considerations are underway. Okay. Uh, on China, uh, obviously the meeting is yet to happen uh, yeah. today. But at the end of this whole process, uh, once Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Blinken come back, mm -hmm. what does the president think is the next right step? Is it further meetings at this level? Is it more direct conversation like the one he had for several hours uh, last month mm -hmm. with President Xi? Um, is it a response to uh, the Chinese-related uh, hack that uh, he's also trying to go deal with? I expect he'll make a determination about that when they return and he has a chance to talk to Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan, in part because he doesn't see this, nor do they, as a preset series of meetings, like the traditional um, dialogues that we've seen uh, throughout other administrations, including ones that he has previously served in. Uh, you know, this meeting, we certainly anticipate will have a difficult components of the conversation. We expect it to be frank. Uh, they plan to cover areas where we have concerns, including human rights, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, obviously, we've, uh, we've uh, put forward some sanctions uh, related to uh, the uh, anti-democratic actions in Hong Kong over the last couple of days. Technology, whether it relates to theft, uh, the theft of uh, IP or uh, data protections. Uh, military tensions in the region. So it will cover, as will be no surprise to anyone here who follows China closely, a range of topics. And I think the President's eager to hear from them on how the conversation goes and work with them to determine what the next right step is. I will say that in his mind and in the minds of um, National Security Advisor Sullivan and, and Secretary of State um, Blinken, a big part of the strategy is uh, approaching our relationship with China from a, a place of strength and strengthening our uh, own uh, economy at home, investing in the middle class, uh, looking at it through uh, the prism of uh, competition, not conflict. And that means there's also more work we have to do here. From your answer, things like the economic and strategic dialogue which took place in the Obama administration mm -hmm. and continued some in the, in the Trump administration, that's over for now. I, I would simply say that this meeting is not a part of a series of, uh, of, the, of meetings at this point in time. Go ahead. Uh, to to oh, <laughs> sorry, Jeff. You're, you're kind of getting hazed for your scooplet. I can take it. Right, I know you can. Okay. He'll just sit on his scooplet and he doesn't care. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, a couple questions on schools. Um, last month, the CDC released school guidance urging six feet of distance between students and staff. And now the CDC director says she's revisiting this. We're reporting that this could come as early as tomorrow, that mm -hmm. that will go from six feet to three feet. Mm -hmm. What does the White House say to teachers who are concerned that the science hasn't changed in five weeks and that this is political, this change? I would say that uh, the CDC is full of health and medical experts, including Dr. Walensky, who would be the last person to characterize herself as political. Uh, she is a medical health expert, and she has uh, looked at this through the prism of uh, how we can um, uh, take steps to make it safe to reopen schools and is constantly evaluating how to ease some of the restrictions. And there are, of course, more that often you have all have asked about in here, which are good questions. What about travel? What about masks? Uh, you know, they take an approach that is purely through the science. So we'll let her speak more about it when they're ready to release those formal guidelines. White House directs states to do something with that guidance when it's released, similar to what we saw when the president uh, made the uh, direction on vaccine eligibility. You mean like will we direct schools to, to now do this? The CDC has said this, six to three feet. You now have to follow this to push for reopening. Well, social distancing is one of the mitigation measures, right, in the CDC guidance. And I don't know, I have not seen the CDC guidance, uh, so I don't know how it will be characterized in there. Uh, but I would certainly say we'd have Secretary Cardona 
who was just here yesterday, work with schools and school districts to implement. And social distancing is one of the steps, masking, testing, vaccinations, and see how it can help reopen schools more quickly. And you wouldn't see this, I mean, kind of overnight, go from six to three feet in the schools that are open right now and possibly increase the number of students that can be in the classroom before the end of the year. I don't have a timeline for it. I, I don't anticipate we'd ask any school to do something immediately overnight, um, but it will just be additional guidance, which a lot of schools are looking for from health health and medical experts on, on how to safely reopen schools and ensure that uh, the, the parents in the community, the uh, teachers in the community, the students feel safe going to school. And this just, as they're considering options, this is one of the options uh, that will, that the, um, one of the mitigation steps a school can take. Uh, go ahead. Um, two quick questions mm -hmm. uh, to continue with the Scoopla theme. Okay. Um, <laughs> there was uh, a, a report just about an hour ago that uh, the president intends to nominate Bill Nelson as NASA chief. Uh, can you confirm that? I have seen those reports. I don't have any personnel announcements to make today. Uh, Seems like a cool job, though, that I'm not currently on the path to, but it's fine. You're not auditioning right now? I'm certainly not. Uh, I don't have any personnel announcements to make. Certainly seeing the reports. As we have any updates, we'll provide them. And the second question, you know, the president said yesterday that he intends to try to raise taxes on anyone that was making over $400,000 a year. Uh, does he think that that's, uh, does he intend to wait until the economy is out of uh, the pandemic recession? Or does he feel confident that, uh, that by making it only on higher earners that it will not affect the broader economy? Well, uh, the president is certainly focused on ensuring the economy is continuing to recover and that people are going back to work and uh, able to put food on the table to feed their families. When we're talking about people, ma uh, families making over $400,000 a year, that's about 2% of households in this country. And this is a commitment that he talked about on the campaign trail. And his interest is in ensuring that people f pay their fair share whether it's corporations or the highest income earners in our country. And uh, he believes that um, you know, hard work should be rewarded and that this is one of the areas where there, could, uh, where there is an opportunity to uh, rebalance uh, how our policies are currently. But I, I, you know, he would do this in coordination with, of course, members of Congress, members of his economic team. And we obviously don't have a proposed plan at this point, but it is a, is a, it is a, um, a policy that he talked about on the campaign trail. And he reiterated, as you noted earlier this week. Did you have a second question, too? Or no? Th th those are the two. The oh, go question. This, OK, OK, got it. OK, OK. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, yay. <laughs> the man of the hour. On AstraZeneca, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the US has 7 million doses, releasable doses. And the yes. company itself has said, uh, it expects to have up to 30 million uh, in April. Given that, mm -hmm. will the U.S. consider lending, sharing more of these doses with the other countries that are asking now that you've confirmed that you're, you're doing the same for Mexico and Canada? We don't have anything to preview, but we all uh, have a number of requests uh, from a range of countries around the world and certainly will continue those conversations. Okay, but no commitment at this point to share specifically the AstraZeneca vaccine with others? Well, I will say, broadly speaking, we also anticipate having additional doses of Moderna, of Pfizer, of a range of vaccines, even as we focus on vaccinating, ensuring every American, every adult American has access to the vaccine. It's just a matter of timeline. So I just don't have a, a an update or a preview on that, but certainly we'll have those conversations and we are open to uh, receiving those requests and, and obviously uh, making considerations. All right, and just on one yeah. other issue, your uh, new U.S. Trade Representative will be ceremonially sworn in later yes. today. Um, 97 to 0, that's I think was her vote. Big number. It's pretty solid. What, uh, how soon will she start leading uh, trade talks with the UK? I don't have anything to preview. Obviously, that's driven by the policies and the agenda of the president uh, and the overall economic team. I'm sure we'll be integrating her into uh, all of the policy discussions as, as soon as she's sworn in. Let me just go to the, get to the folks in the back. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a couple quick questions. When you were talking a moment ago about diplomatic negotiations between the United States and Mexico, um, you said crisis on the border. Is, is, was that a... Uh, Challenges issue? on the border. Okay. But so that's not, that doesn't reflect any change in nope. the administration's view of things. Nope. Uh, okay. Well, uh, another quick question then. Um, on Monday, the president said it's important to get the vaccine and then, quote, even after that, until everyone...
vaccinated to wear this mask, unquote. Uh, was he speaking generally, or does he believe that we should all be wearing masks until everyone is, in fact, vaccinated? Well, I think what he's reflecting is the guidance from our health experts that uh, even if you're vaccinated, I am vaccinated, I still wear a mask because there hasn't been conclusive studies yet on the transferability of the the uh, uh, pandemic or of COVID uh, for, from those who have been vaccinated. And, he's, and he, it continues to be the advice of health and medical experts to continue to wear masks. Right, but every American, is that the standard until every American has been vaccinated or was he speaking generally? I think he's speaking generally about the need to still observe uh, measures like social distancing and wearing of masks so that even when you're vaccinated, you're keeping your neighbors, your friends, your family members safe. Yeah, um, and then back in January, you noted that the administration was reviewing how unmarried couples were uh, handled under travel restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any developments on those restrictions? Um, I know that there's a lot on the administration's plate. Yeah. But in, in how um, unmarried uh, binational couples are, are treated? I don't have any update for you. The review is ongoing. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. Thank you. You're very generous. Um, the Equality Act, as it's currently written, would eliminate the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, as a defense for religious organizations against discrimination claims. Given that President Biden voted in favor of RIFRA, uh, does he support it being abolished now? I would have to check on the specific components of the package. I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that for you after the briefing. Go ahead in the back. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, two East Asia question and one uh, Asian American question. Okay. If I may. <clears throat> um, on U.S. China talks, can we expect the uh, joint statement after talks? A joint statement uh, between them? Uh, I, I don't have anything to preview. I know that um, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan and Secretary Blinken will be speaking briefly after the talks conclude, but I don't have anything to preview for you in terms of a joint statement. Okay, another question is, according to Japanese media, uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Suga will meet uh, President Biden on April 9th. Uh, can you confirm that? Uh, I know there have been reports uh, about a future meeting, and the President's certainly looking forward to meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, I don't believe a final confirmation has been made here of what that meeting will look like and what the format would be. Okay, and one Asian-American question. Okay on the unfortunate uh, Atlanta shooting. Mm -hmm. We already see the uh, half staff outside. Um, yesterday, you blamed the, the prior administration about this, which uh, some people agree. Uh, but as what uh, actuals reports, quote, the United States rivalry with China had already created unease about Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, unquote. And actually says, uh, we are going to see a huge jump in hate crimes against Asian Americans this year. So it seems to be that President Biden is in this catch-22. Um, on the one hand, he is trying to alleviate uh, the, the hate crimes against Asians and Asian Americans. On the other hand, he kind of escalates the tension. How can he uh, really alleviate this situation? I would just refute the notion of that question. I would say that yesterday I was asked, which was a good question, if we thought that the former president's rhetoric had contributed to uh, the um, actions or the, um, the discrimination against Asian Americans. And I said, we do, because rhetoric, uh, certainly from the, the um, the massive megaphone you have from the White House is something that is heard across the country, and it's important to then be thoughtful about the words you use and how you convey uh, opposition to discrimination of any kind. Uh, that was the answer, the question I was answering. Uh, the president is, and the vice president, are meeting with leaders of the Asian American community tomorrow. Uh, they, the president raised the rhetoric, the, his concerns about rhetoric, about attacks, about threats against the Asian American community in the country during his prime time address. He signs an executive order. He's asked his members of admi administration to uh, listen, hear, think about policy solutions. I would say he's, his effort is to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, so I would uh, just dispute your, uh, your question. Go ahead in the back. Thanks, Jen. Uh, a few questions for you. The president mentioned in his ABC interview uh, his thoughts on potential changes to the filibuster. Mm -hmm. I wondered 
Uh, does he support getting rid of the 60 vote threshold on the legislative filibuster? I think what he said is that he'd be open to hearing ideas about going back to the talking filibuster, which Mr. Smith goes to Washington is the best reference that uh, anyone can make on that front. Obviously, that hasn't been uh, the law in the Senate for since before I was born, uh, so many years. Uh, but he that is a that is a proposal that had been put forward by Senator Manchin, and his whole point is that, uh, and as he as he said in his uh, comments, you know, our democracy looks at moments like it's broken, and uh, it shouldn't be so easy to block legislation. At the same time, his preference and his priority is working with Democrats and Republicans to find a pathway forward on a range of issues where there has been a history of bipartisan support, whether it's infrastructure, immigration, uh, addressing, uh, making our economy and our workers more competitive against, uh, against the competition with China. There are a lot of ways we can work together. That's his preference. And so he was just expressing an openness to hearing from members of the Senate on what their ideas are. Ultimately, though, as president, he doesn't get a, he doesn't vote here. It's not a law. He signs into law. It's a Senate rule. So uh, you'll have to talk to them about uh, what their ideas are and what they have the votes for to move forward. But he would defer to senators on whether they would support scrapping. It's not about deferring. Vote. He's not in the Senate. He doesn't decide what the Senate rules are. They do. Influence if he were to voice an opinion. He's going to have the, the senators decide uh, what, uh, what rules they want to abide by moving forward. A couple other quick ones. Um, I wonder, there are a few key agencies that have yet to have uh, Senate nominated or confirmed leaders that are um, certainly mm -hmm. in the news now, uh, CBP, ICE, um, mm -hmm. the FDA during the pandemic. I wonder, does the administration have any plans or timetable for when it might uh, put forward nominees to lead those agencies? All important agencies. Um, I don't have any update on the personnel process, but we're working our way through and ensuring we have the right people uh, we can nominate for each of those important roles. Okay. And then lastly, um, I wonder, uh, this week there was a group of college basketball players ahead of the NCAA tournament who started a protest on social media with the hashtag not NCAA property. Um, and they're looking for more financial freedom and personal protections from the NCAA. I wonder, um, one of the things they're asking for is a meeting with federal officials and potentially the Biden administration to talk about legislation on this. So does the president support uh, college athletes being able to profit off their name and likeness? And would the administration be willing to meet with these players if they asked for a meeting? I'm happy to see if there's any plans for a meeting and if we've received the request. Go ahead in the back. Thank you, Jen. Um, questions on US-China meeting. Um, China has a poor record of um, keeping promises. So how would you characterize um, the level of trust that the current administration has with regard to China? And also uh, for the for the, uh, China, China, for the bilateral meeting between President Biden and President Xi, um, what are the conditions that has to be happen? What are the conditions for the meeting to happen? Thank you. I don't think I'm here to set conditions today. There, we haven't even announced the specific details about the um, climate summit that's happening in April, which I think was what the bilateral question was around. And we certainly haven't made a final decision about any bilateral meetings around that meeting. As we do, I'm sure we can discuss it further. Uh, and then as it relates uh, to the meeting uh, today, I, I think one uh, or that starts today, I should say, um, it was important to our administration that the first meeting uh, with uh, Chinese officials be held on American soil and occur after we have met and consulted closely with partners and allies in both Asia and Europe. This is an opportunity to address a wide variety of issues, including ones where we have deep disagreements. And so uh, our focus is on having a frank discussion, raising issues where we have concerns, and of course, looking for ways and places where we can work together. Uh, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, while you've been briefing, President Putin has just extended an invitation to President Biden to continue their conversation, but this time he wants to do it live. He's asking for a live streamed conversation, an open, direct dialogue. Putin says he's available tomorrow or Monday. Is this something that you would consider? Uh, I'll have to get back to you if that is something we are entertaining. Uh, I would say that the president uh, already had um, a conversation already with President Putin, even if as there are more world leaders that he has not yet engaged with. And we engage with Russian uh, leaders, uh, members of the government at all levels, uh, but I don't have anything to report to you in terms of a future meeting. The president will, of course, be in Georgia tomorrow 
and quite busy. Go ahead. One very quick final question on the wall on mm -hmm. day one in office. I think it was the president signed a proclamation yeah. that was effectively putting a pause or halting mm -hmm. wall construction. Um, at the time, I think he directed federal agencies to formulate a plan within 60 days, depending who's counting. We're on 58, 59, or we have almost. two more days. Do we have? Okay, some said 59. I thought it was one, but we'll go with two more days. Um, to redirect border fund, uh, border wall funds, and quote resume, modify, or terminate segments of the structure that remain under construction. Um, have those federal agencies provided you with their conclusions? Have you mm -hmm. come to a conclusion? What is the status of that with that remaining one or two days left? I will check and see if there's an update. Um, we are, um, of course, there is funding that was appropriated previously that is still moving forward. Um, money that has not been appropriated, as you noted, we've kind of pulled back on. Uh, but I will check and see. We have two more days, which is a lifetime in this place, uh, and see if we have an update for you on the That's status. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, it's okay. Oh, it's your first day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Welcome. <laughs> so a lot of my colleagues uh, in this room and outside this room have been asking for a while now about the possibility of visiting these facilities where unaccompanied children are being mm -hmm. held after arriving and applying for asylum at the border. And part of the pushback that we've received from you and from DHS and HHS uh, is that there are privacy concerns um, about reporters potentially, you know. And COVID. And uh, privacy concerns of COVID, but specifically to privacy. Reporters have been allowed inside these facilities for years through multiple administrations by multiple agencies, including by the last administration during uh, the family separation crisis, where I think the risk of like further emotional damage to these kids is pretty acute. So, has there been, to your knowledge, any instant I incident in which a kid's privacy was violated by reporters who were there to cover the facilities in which they were being detained? Oh, oh during the last administration? During like a, the long history of reporters being I, I would say, as I noted in response to a question or two questions that were asked earlier that were very similar, our big concern uh, has been the pandemic and COVID and safety. Of course, there are privacy concerns that anyone takes into account, or I would say any administration should take into account as it relates to members of the media visiting a facility where there are children, as I'm, as I'm sure you would certainly agree on. I can't speak to what the approach was of the prior administration who was ripping children from the arms of their parents. So I can't speak to what their policies were, but we are working and we're very committed here from the White House and from the government in finding a way soon, very soon, uh, to ensure that there's access by the media uh, not by not by us providing you with what we see, but by the media to these shelter facilities. Uh, we believe it's it's important and vital, and we're committed to it. And we're just working through the pandemic. This is about the safety of staff, the safety of kids, as well. And that's uh, that's what we're working through at this point in time. So hopefully, I'll have an update soon. Thanks, everyone. Okay. okay. Social distancing. Speaking of. Yeah. Um, the president said uh, in the interview when he was discussing uh, going back to you know potential talking filibuster. Uh, that the filibusters want on its mind because, uh, quote, we're almost getting to a point where democracy is having a hard time functioning. But uh, my colleague points out that that dynamic has been true specifically in the Senate for a very long time, years even. Um, so was there anything specific to the current dynamic in the Senate uh, that made President Biden sort of decide that you know, now is a moment to change the filibuster rules. Sure. Well, as I answered in response to the question just a few minutes ago, uh, there are a number of ideas that members of the Senate have put forward. Uh, they range. Some are against changing the filibuster in the Democratic Party. Some are for it. Some are for going back to a talking filibuster, back to the days of, of Mr. Smith goes to Washington. He's, he's watching it closely. He was in the Senate for 36 years. He's happy to hear their ideas. His preference remains working with Democrats and Republicans to get business done uh, for the American people. So it's a conversation, as you well know, that's happening on Capitol Hill right now. And he's certainly watching it, as most other people are as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.